Hi, everyone. Thank you all so much for having me tonight. Um, it's always cool to be in a room where I don't know almost anyone, except for David and Anne and a few others. But um, it's nice to get out of the bubble of politics where everyone already knows everyone in the room. Um, so my name is Joanna Klonsky. I am a communications strategy consultant. Uh, and I primarily work with uh, political candidates, elected officials, government agencies, advocacy organizations, nonprofits. Um, and I'm here tonight to talk to you about m one of my favorite clients and the client that probably takes up the most of my time and has probably taken the most years off of my life, uh, which is the Chicago City Council Progressive Caucus. Uh, the Progressive Caucus is 11 out of the 50 aldermen, so that is 22% of the City Council. Did I, any math people, did I do that right? 22%, I believe. Um, and uh, I, I started working with the Progressive Caucus right when it launched, back in 2012 or perhaps early 2013. Um, I had come out of several years of just working on political campaigns. Uh, and an, an alderman who is part of the Progressive Caucus, Alderman Rick Munoz of the 22nd Ward. I don't think we have any 22nd Warders in here tonight. This little village, Lawndale. Uh, asked me if I'd like to help. They were getting ready to launch this new thing. At the time, there were eight members. Um, that was in 2012, 2013. Since then, we've had a municipal election, as you guys probably remember, the whole Chewy Rom situation. There were also 50 aldermanic, well, maybe not 50, there were a few that weren't up for re-election, but there were also aldermanic races all over the city um, back in 2015. And so since that time of the launch of the Progressive Caucus, we've gone from eight members to 11. Um, which is actually a pretty, a pretty big jump. Um, I was proud to help reelect. Uh, all the members of the Progressive Caucus who ran for reelection in 2015 were reelected, and then we also picked up four seats. Um, so uh, I thought tonight I would talk a little bit about what my job is like uh, day to day uh, as, a, as the communications sort of strategy media person, uh, and a little bit about how the environment in City Council and City Hall has changed dramatically since I started working in City Hall way back in 2012 compared to now, um, and why. And then I thought, uh, you know, Derek and I were talking a little earlier today, and I thought maybe we could look at a kind of an example or a case study of a, a big fight that we just had uh, in City Council, which is the fight around regulating rideshare uh, companies. Um, thought that might be something that's of a lot of relevance to the folks in this space. Um, and then I'll take your questions. Um, so my job as the communications person for, for elected officials or, or for the Progressive Caucus in particular is I'm the person who helps figure out how do we talk about what we're doing. Um, anytime you see a politician on TV talking or standing behind a podium and having a press conference, there's a me behind the scenes that helped make that happen and helped figure out down to the minor details, so uh, what is the shot that we want the cameras to pick up? What's behind the person or who's behind the person? Is there an image on the screen or no image on the screen? Is there a step and repeat? Is there a visual aid? Is there a crowd of activists or community members? Um, what are the talking points? What's the, what, are, what is the most simple way to communicate uh, the core message? What are we trying to do here? That's my job as the behind the scenes person making that happen. I'm also the person who like makes sure there's a microphone and a podium and does lots of unspectacular things like that. Uh, but without those things, we wouldn't be able to make sure people could hear us, so it matters. Um, so that's the simplest way to talk about what I do. Uh, when a press release goes out, often I'm the one who wrote it and hit send. Um, there's a lot of more uh, nuanced stuff involving relationships. Uh, so often I'm, I, I spend a lot of my day just talking to people on the phone or in person, talking to reporters, having coffee with reporters, um, and setting up issues, explaining the backstory on a big policy fight that's coming up, um, explaining what the dynamics are in terms of the relationships between the aldermen and the sponsors of any piece of legislation. Um, sometimes it's as simple as explaining how the process really works. So for a piece of legislation to pass, Someone has to introduce it, someone has to sponsor it, uh, then it has to get sent to a committee meeting, then there's a, the committee meeting happens and there's a vote, then it either passes or it fails, then it goes to the full city council. Sometimes it's about me laying that sort of basic stuff out for a given reporter or a group of reporters. So that's sort of the background on what my job is. Um, and then there's also the part about 
helping 11 different elected officials get on the same page and make sure that they're all singing from the same song sheet. Um, that can be a really hard job sometimes. Uh, uh, so that's, that's part of it too. Um, when the Pro Progressive Caucus was first formed um, in the early years of the Emanuel administration, uh, when there were eight members, it was very much seen as an anti-Rahm Emanuel opposition bloc. Uh, the situation was very polarized in City Hall uh, to, the, to the degree that I would say members of the Progressive Caucus were almost seen as pariahs. They, they uh, rarely were able to get legislation passed. They spent a lot more time on defense, trying to stop bad things from happening, or stop, I shouldn't say bad things, trying to stop policies from passing that we saw as harmful to the city's neighborhoods and regular folks, working families. Um, it was difficult to build alliances with people who weren't in the Progressive Caucus. Uh, reason being that a lot of aldermen who weren't in the Progressive Caucus uh, we're pretty much sticking to the, to the mayor's office as, as their main source of support and security. Their, their, uh, the conventional wisdom is you stick with the mayor, you'll be all right, you'll get reelected, and you can keep, keep coasting on through. That has changed. Um, how many people, I know a lot of people are from Skokie and Evanston, but how many people actually voted in the 2015 municipal elections? All right, actually, that's not bad. Um, it was, it was a big one. Uh, it, was, it was an incredibly significant election and a lot changed, uh, not, just at the, not just at the mayoral level, but uh, I would say more significantly at, at the city council level. Um, many of the aldermen who were most inclined to uh, stick, with the, stick with the administration no matter what, whether it was right or wrong, um, whether they agreed with the issue or not, a lot of those people lost their seats. Um, even though there was a multi-million dollar super PAC called Chicago Forward that was designed to protect them and designed to take out members of the Progressive Caucus. Um, you, there's been lots reported on about that if anybody wants to look it up. Uh, so the message coming, the lesson coming out of that election was everybody who demonstrated some independence and some uh, tendency to think for themselves and do what's right for the people got reelected. And the, uh, many of the ones who didn't, did not. Um, including lots of people who seemed invincible, who seemed like incredibly powerful, people who'd been in for decades, uh, had tons of money in the bank, uh, lost their seats. Sometimes to sort of upstart, or, or almost lost their seats. Some of them kept their seats, but just by the skin of their teeth, to just sort of upstart progressive grassroots candidates. So that really changed the tenor in city council um, in this new term. Uh, many aldermen are much more inclined to demonstrate that they're thinking for themselves and taking action independently. To compound that, to make, to make that even more extreme, I think the, there were two other factors. Uh, one was the largest property tax increase in Chicago's history, which happened last November, and yes, in the fall. Um, David, November? <laughs> Thank you. Uh, that, it passed. Uh, many, mem many members of the city council voted to make it happen, but they also recognized that with that vote um, came a lot of vulnerability, and that, that created even more pressure for some of those aldermen to demonstrate some independence, to, to take some independent votes, and to you know, be more willing to work with progressive aldermen, be more willing to work with progressive allies, and think more proactively about introducing legislation to demonstrate to their constituents that they're actually trying to get some stuff done for them. And then there's the third, the third factor, which I'm sure everyone in this room is aware of, um, that, changed the, that changed the dynamics in city council, which is the sort of the after, the, the release of the Laquan McDonald video and the aftermath of that, of that you know, what happened as a result. Um, Every alderman in city council feels the impact of that, I would say. And I think the administration has been rocked to its core uh, as a result. Um, I, I don't think most people would dispute that at this point. Um, and so what we've seen, that was November 24th or so, so pretty soon after the, ooh, that's okay. That was, that was, that was dramatic. <laughs> so all this to say, 
those three factors, the, the results of the election, the property tax increase, the historic property tax increase, the results of the Laquan McDonald video have drastically changed the environment in city council. And where we find ourselves now is in a place where there are many new opportunities to really move progressive policy ideas through the city council. And some are, some are passing and some are not, but the legislative process is happening in a way that I've never seen it before and that it certainly wasn't when I started working in City Hall. So a couple of examples of that in the last couple of months or just this, this last city council meeting, June 22nd, we passed an ordinance. Um, and when I say we, I mean the Progressive Caucus, but also many aldermen who aren't in the Progressive Caucus because it passed unanimously. Uh, passed an ordinance that will guarantee paid sick time off to 460,000 workers in Chicago. Um, that's undisputably going to make life better for a lot of people. That's the kind of progressive policy that uh, the Progressive Caucus champions and that other aldermen are more and more also working together to get done. Um, we recently passed, and Ann Emer I keep referring, I keep like looking at this person, this blonde girl over here is um, Ann Emerson who does a lot of policy and legislative work in city council and writes a lot of legislation. Um, so she worked really hard on this. We, we recently passed an ordinance called the, you're gonna have to help me, Debt Transparency, and Account Debt Transparency Accountability and Performance or Ordinance that will create new requirements for transparency and accountability anytime the city gets into more debt. Um, that's a really big, I know it's not super sexy, but it's a really big deal. <laughs> Maybe, I mean, this room might be, find that more sexy than the average. <laughs> um, so we're getting stuff done in a way that I don't think we would have been able to. I'm, I'm positive we would not have been able to when I first started working in City Hall um, a couple years back. Um, so now I just thought I would talk about one thing we didn't get done, which is the, the rideshare ordinance. Um, how many people take Uber or Lyft a lot? Who has the app on your phone? I do too. Actually, I don't have Uber anymore. I have Lyft now only. Um, the Progressive Caucus and others uh, and allies uh, in the disability community, in the labor movement, and you know, other organizations have been trying really hard to pass legislation uh, to create some basic fairness and regulations for this in new industry. Um, some requirements around transparency and accountability, some requirements that these companies serve folks with disabilities, which right now, as of right now, they don't have to. Um, some requirements around, uh, around public safety, since you're getting in the car with a random stranger. Good idea to make sure they're not a serial killer or something like that. Um, so we have worked really hard to, to write, to craft legislation that would achieve those things. We worked hard with, uh, you know, aldermen who were in the Progressive Caucus, who weren't in the Progressive Caucus, and we were able to pass legislation that got us toward those goals just two Fridays ago in, the public safe, in, a, in a joint committee hearing of the Public Safety Committee and a committee called License and Consumer Protection. Um, did it pass unanimously? It did. It passed unanimously, unanimously in committee. Um, by the following Monday, the Emanuel administration had introduced a substitute ordinance that completely stripped it to its bones. Of, uh, I'm sorry, introduced it on Monday and it passed in city council on Wednesday. Um, so as of right now, there is not uh, re any law on the books that requires, uh, well, it's pretty vague, let's put it that way. The, the, the regulation, the rideshare regulation to an ordinance that passed is pretty toothless and vague uh, and very problematic. Uh, right now there are, let me emphasize again, I use rideshare, I think it's a great invention. Right now we, as a city, we don't know how many cars are on the road at any given moment. We don't know what kind of pollution they're creating or what kind of uh, problems they're, or stresses they're creating on our infrastructure as a city. So it's really difficult for us to anticipate how we're gonna need to invest um, to address that. Um, there, is there any revenue attached to the ride share ordinance? Uh, that's actually, that's a little unclear right now. It's a little unclear as to what, how, what, kind of revenue, what kind of taxes these companies are gonna have to pay in exchange for being, having access to our streets and our uh, roads and bridges and emergency response uh, you know, department and all that kind of stuff. So um, I thought that might be something that this room was really, w might be interested in. Um, when we talk about how data impacts public policy and how transparency 
can really make an impact here, this is one area where um, clearly the, the benefits are necessary. Um, we haven't been able to get it done, but I would say uh, the fight is certainly not over. I think that we will continue working on it. Uh, my top priority personally is to make sure, I think that the idea that there can be corporations that are allowed to operate in our city and not have to explicitly be required to serve folks with disabilities, it should be unacceptable to all of us. Uh, to my mind, and this I don't think is a, even a progressive concept, the role of government should be when a corporation comes to town and says, I'm going to operate here and I don't want to serve people with disabilities, the role of government should be to say, um, no, that's actually not acceptable. You can't do that if you want to do business in the third biggest city in America. So, um, so that gives you a sense of sort of what kind of fights we have in City Hall still. It's, there has not been a revolution yet, although things, are, things have changed. Um, and, and some of the problems that I try to help, to help the aldermen and the aldermanic staff to solve. Um, and with that, I guess I, could, I can take questions. Uh, the airborne thing that happened about the same time with the, the housing. Airbnb. Yeah. Right? Can you talk, talk a little bit about how that worked through with the system? Yeah, sure. I, I actually, um, I can, but it's, it, it's not something that I paid as much attention to. Um, but I think it was a similar question around, you have a, a new uh, technology company that has come in and become really popular, and how do you regulate it and make sure people are safe um, and make sure that it, people can access it in a fair way and make sure that there is revenue attached to it? Because guess what? We're in crisis in Chicago, and our schools may not open in the fall, uh, as you guys saw with the budget calculator uh, or timer. Um, and so if, if these sorts of companies want to do business here, there has to be, um, they have to also be willing to contribute and pay their fair share and make sure that folks, um, that everyone is, is benefiting from the economy here in Chicago and not just mm. a certain few. Um, so what ended up passing, I think, got us part of the way to that goal. I have not read the Airbnb ordinance, so I'm hesitant to talk too much more in depth than that. Um, I don't know, do you want to add anything to that? I mean, it, it went back and forth. They were, as a company, much more willing to um, come to conversations and... Uh, I, I think there was a much greater willingness to uh, discuss regulation and to... I don't even really want to say submit to regulation. Uh, I think overall, um, kind of their, their company mission was, was uh, much more... Um, they were much more interested in being a vested partner in the city. Uh, that was not something that I anyway saw in many of the negotiations that happened with Rideshare. Um, so there, there were a few um, aldermen who had some problems with some zoning controls that were going to be shifted to certain um, departments in the city. And, but I think that overall our position was that seeing regulation and seeing responsible regulation come forward with such a large industry, um, especially as it relates to the shared economy, the gig economy, which is something that's kind of unfolding as it happens, uh, was, we were, we were happy to see that happen. And it was a move, it was movement in the right direction. This question is from Stephen Luker, sitting to my left. Since Uber drivers use their own cars, how would accessible vehicles be possible? How do you legislate that? Yeah, that's a really good question. Um, Uber has lots of money. And so um, <laughs> they have lots and lots of money. And uh, so they're going to have to figure it out. Um, I, I believe that they have some of the most brilliant minds in the world working on their team, and they can find a way to solve that problem. Uh, it can't be an excuse that the model, it, there, that is a very slippery slope, and that can go very far. That, well, our model requires us to not serve people with disabilities. Sorry. Oh, okay. Ha no, that's not acceptable. Yeah. Yeah, it's, I'm not hostile toward Uber, obviously. <laughs> <laughs> Got it. Are there any, like, when the legislation for the rideshare programs was, was coming about, did, was Uber very involved in those talks, and were there kind of concerns or... Maybe how did the events in Austin maybe influence some of the things that were going on? Yeah, there? absolutely. Um, 
Yes, Uber and, and Lyft, too, uh, were very much involved in the conversation. Um, their influence was very heavily felt. They had many, many lobbyists um, roaming the halls of City Hall and prop might still be in there, for all I know right now. Uh, they might have moved in permanently. Uh, <laughs> I was in a briefing for aldermen just the other week where there were probably, you know, 10 aldermen in the room, a couple of staffers, and then four or five uh, rideshare lobbyists. They had such a large proportion of the people in the room. Uh, there were not lobbyists in the room for, for the, you know, the other side, for the ask me the union or the disability advocacy groups or anyone like that. Um, so their, their influence was certainly felt in a really outsized way. Um, I think that what happened in Austin certainly influenced the narrative around this debate. Um, you can imagine my job is to, my job is to argue um, the position of my client to the media. Uh, the media tends to be pretty enamored with the rideshare companies. Like, this is such a cool technology. I can take it. Like, I've had lots of reports be like, I have it right here. And I'm like, that's cool, me too. That doesn't change the fact that this company, these companies need to be regulated. But I think what happened in Austin, where they actually pulled out, um, created a little bit of hysteria for, for some members of the media and, and um, particularly some columnists who said, well, we can't do anything because they've threatened to leave and they left Austin. So we can't do anything. We can't require them to do anything because they left Austin. Um, guys, Chicago is the third biggest city in America. Um, it's really big. Uh, <laughs> it, whenever a huge corporation threatens to leave Chicago if they have to follow basic rules, the hairs on the back of your neck should stand up. It's, I mean, I would not want them to leave. I don't want anyone to leave. Um, but I will tell you that if they did leave because they were forced to serve people with disabilities and pay taxes, then we would probably be better served by a competitor who popped up in their space who was a little more responsible. Am I wrong? So uh, that's the argument. We had a little bit of an uphill battle to, to, to make with some of the media. And, and what happened in Austin made it harder in some ways. Um, we often had to remind people Chicago is not Austin. And if I had to guess, I would say rideshare is coming back to Austin. It's a matter of time. When you're working on passing legislation that involves collecting additional revenue from companies, yeah. what sort of um, precautions are you taking to make sure that that revenue is getting into the right hands? That's a good question. Making sure that the revenue is getting into the right hands. Um, so sometimes, uh, Airbnb is a good example of this, sometimes there will be a sort of a directed stream of revenue uh, that's dedicated to a specific cause. So with Airbnb, uh, correct me if I'm wrong, uh, there's, uh, there's a fee now on Airbnb hosts. Uh, that revenue that comes in, I think 4% of it has to go towards addressing homelessness in particular. Uh, I guess they, they whoever negotiated that deal felt, let's tie together, this is a housing issue, this is a housing issue, um, we can create a dedicated stream of revenue to try to address a specific problem. Sometimes that happens. Um, but our budget deficit is really large, and so there's a limit to how much that's useful, because at the end of the day, we have to pay into pensions, <laughs> and that's not always like as cool or as um, easily packageable. Um, and you might, not see, uh, you might not see a dedicated stream of revenue from a, from a cool new app uh, wanting to have its tax money go into pension uh, obligations or something like that. But at the end of the day, there are a whole, there are schools need funding, there's a, there's a whole range of um, areas of government. Some of them are cool and, and sexy and some of them aren't that all need to be funded. Um, and so that's the challenge that we're facing right now. Um, so this is kind of a more general question. Uh, are there things that you feel like the media often uh, misinterpret about city council? Like, are there things that the tendencies they have that like really annoy you? Yeah. <laughs> well, I don't want to piss off any members of the media because I need them. No, I'm just kidding. Um, I think early on, I was actually talking to a reporter this morning in preparation for this, um, who acknowledged that in the early years of the Emanuel administration, the, the press corps was pretty light on them. 
You know, they, they, there was this idea that Ram was this kind of like wonderkind whiz kid uh, and who was going to bring all of this great stuff to Chicago and therefore we should kind of like cut him some slack and, and roll with him. And I think sometimes that still comes back up. It's definitely, definitely different now. Um, but sometimes there's just sort of, um, I, I think even in what happened with the rideshare ordinance on, on Wednesday, um, a lot of the reporting about it got it way wrong and was like, this was a brilliant strategic maneuver on the part of the Emanuel administration, as opposed to like, wait, this is really problematic. Like, shouldn't we look at this? Shouldn't we unpack what's even in the ordinance? You know, that ordinance, almost no one read it before voting on it. And the aldermen acknowledged it. They didn't have time. It was given to them the night before or the morning of. Um, the press didn't get it until after the vote had taken place. It was handed out after the vote. Um, many of the aldermen, I promise you, still have not read the ordinance and don't know what it does. Uh, the, we really needed the press to say, whoa, what's going on? What's the emergency? Why are we jamming this thing through at the 11th hour when literally no one, including lobbyists for Lyft, told the press they hadn't even read it? And it was supposedly to help them. Um, so that's a case where I, I was frustrated with a bunch of the coverage that I felt like didn't, where the due diligence hadn't been done. So my, my question is about uh, data impacting government. And um, what I'm wondering is, uh, you know, in your experience working with the Progressive Caucus, uh, if there's ever been any situations where, you know, maybe some of the members of the caucus could have really benefited from a particular data set or a set of analysis or, you know, just in terms of maybe deciding what to prioritize or helping craft an ordinance. And they weren't able to get the data or know even sort of how to go about it. Uh, if that's the situation, is there any uh, methodology for them being able to sort of acknowledge that and ask for help? Yeah, I mean, uh you know, data is so important and it gets manipulated so much uh, because so much of what we do is just try to create a narrative that, you know, use data in a way that supports our narrative and often our opposition is doing the same thing. And it's really hard to fact check or know which, if either which side, can I curse here? Yes. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, it's hard to know sometimes who's bullshitting. Um, and so I think that constantly, I can't even name you a specific example because it's every day. We need, um, we need the ability to fact check and parse data and we need support because, I mean, I'm a communications person. I did pretty bad on my math uh, SAT. Like, this is not my area. We're not super well resourced. We don't have um, teams of researchers who can just go through stuff for us. So. Uh, particularly when it comes to budget season, I would say. So come September, October, we're going to be fully immersed in passing the 20, or trying to get, trying to build the fiscal year 2017 budget for the city of Chicago. Around that time is when we really need all hands on deck to try to parse through what we're given. Because the way it works is like, we'll be handed a book like this, and then, you know, there will be a bunch of meetings, and then you have to vote. And it's like, okay, <laughs> how do we know if this stuff is even what it says it is? Um, that's a big challenge that, that we face um, every year. Um, does that answer your question? Yeah. Okay. <laughs> All right. Um, in the back. Thank you so much for taking kind of a two-part question, um, if you don't mind. That's fine. Go ahead. <laughs> The first one's kind of a little bit off of hers. Um, can you talk a little bit about how two thirds of the city is black or Latino and uh, population? And with the new cloud tax uh, that is hitting every technology company in the city of Chicago, if you don't know about it, this is uh, for delivering any Amazon services, rack space services to any technology company in Austin or Austin, Texas or in Chicago, there's a 9% tax that goes to the end user. And with her question, why aren't they putting some of that money towards uh, these companies like M Relief that need capital out of that money uh, that could totally help, uh, which I think so far is about $12 million. So how can 
those funds be led towards minority technology companies from your view with the Progressive Caucus? Got it. Thank you. Um, I'm not super well versed in the cloud tax issue in general. Uh, I've read a little bit about it, but I'm hesitant to go too far down that road with you. Um, I think in general, uh, do you, so, okay. So your question is, how can we make sure that revenue from uh, the cloud tax is directed towards startups that well, are helping with? The reason is there are 450 technology companies in 1871. Most companies that are built are downtown or north side. Uh -huh. Not a single one is south. Not a single one is west beyond Roosevelt or Western. And they need capital to help grow their businesses and they're not getting venture capital at all yeah. for what they need and maybe this cloud tax should be directed at these underserved companies like breaking voices or in relief or the numerous many other ones that are out there yeah i mean it's a really hard moment to try to take revenue out of government and direct it towards the startup space even if they're performing a service that's benefiting the government um, because literally, as of right now, our schools are not funded to open in September. Like basic things are not funded right now. Um, so I'm with you and I, I think um, in general, we need to find ways to, to make sure that revenue is being spent uh, in a fair and equitable way that's distributed across racial and neighborhood lines. I'm with you 100%. Uh, it's gonna be a hard argument to make right now because we're in such dire straits in terms of our schools, in terms of our, uh, our roads, our infrastructure, um, government, basic services that the government is supposed to provide are not funded adequately right now, period. We're in an emergency right now. Um, and so uh, until we can start to really meaningfully ad address it and start to really generate some revenue from progressive revenue sources, it's hard to talk about almost anything else. Back on the uh, on the uh, government data uh, question, um, I, I can say pretty assuredly that uh, knowing this folks in this room, that if we had that data, that big book of data uh, in computerized form, uh, that there would be a lot of people to step up and help the Progressive Caucus. Um, how, how can you get that for us? I think we can. I think we can. If folks want to help. Uh, parse the bu city budget. It's going to be super cool and exciting. I will buy, I will order you all pizza. Um, you know, we can, I'll hang out for a few minutes afterwards and we can talk about that if folks are interested in working on that project. That'd be great. It actually is super exciting. It is super exciting, I'm saying. I will, yeah, no, it's great. The budget, it's great. Yeah. Well, on that note, thank you, Joanna. Thank you, guys. Appreciate it.